today I want us to look at um, three chapters, or three of my favorite chapters in the Bible uh, concerning Israel. If you would open your Bibles to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. We're actually going to, I should back that up. Why don't you open to Romans 8. Uh, we're going to look at the very end of Romans 8 as an introduction to the ninth chapter. And uh, we'll spend uh, our, our morning in Romans 9, 10, and 11 this session. How many of you have seen Fiddler on the Roof? You know the scene then in, uh, there, there's a scene there where Tevya, the main character, he gets some good news. And the news is that his eldest daughter is going to marry the prosperous local butcher. Remember this? And this is good news for Tevya. Tevya is a, a, a poor man in a very poor shtetl, little Jewish village. And so the fact that his daughter will be marrying this butcher who is prosperous, that's, that's good because not only will she have a comfortable life, but uh, by virtue of being related to this man, it will mean uh, status and, and maybe some, some help uh, even financially for, for his family. But that after he, he talks with the butcher who asked for his, his daughter's hand in marriage, Tevya is on his way home and he's a little inebriated. And he's quickly sobered, though, because the local constable comes to him and says, Tevya, there's going to be a little trouble. And uh, we talked about this yesterday. He means a, a pogrom, a, an attack on the local Jewish community there in Anatevka. And after the, the constable leaves, Tevya, he, he does one of these prayers, if you can call it a prayer. He, he just starts talking to the Lord. And he says, Dear God, did you have to send me news like that today of all days? Then he, he makes this statement. He says, I know, I know, we're the chosen people. But once in a while, couldn't you choose somebody else? You know, that's the, that is, uh, it's funny in that movie and, and in that musical, but that is how many of my Jewish friends think today. When, when we talk about the Jewish people being chosen, they say, yeah, chosen for what? chosen for persecution, chosen for uh, being targeted by the world. Uh, being chosen is, a, is a, something they really don't want. They feel that it's, they've been chosen, but it's often for negative things that they're singled out. And you can't blame them. Anti-Semitism is the norm today for the Jewish community. Um, it's been going on for for centuries in Israel's history, but uh, in the United States, we've reached uh, really unparalleled levels even in just the last year following October 7th. But Israel is not chosen to be a people that is persecuted. That's, that's not God's plan for them, uh, ultimately. And in Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul deals with this question of Israel and their chosenness and, and their future. So I want you to look, before we go to Romans 9, I want you to look at Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 37, Paul writes this. He says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As believers, what should our response be to that? Amen. Right? That there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. If you are saved, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ personally, you're sealed, right? Nothing can take you from Him. And you would think in the book of Romans that this might be the, the crescendo of the whole book. You think about the opening of Romans. and In Romans 1, you open with this really a courtroom scene where God puts everybody on trial, Gentiles and the Jewish people. He talks about how man has, has exchanged the truth of God for the lie how they worship the creation instead of the Creator. He says that even though, uh, even though the nations can look at creation and know that there's a God, uh, 
they have denied that truth. They've denied that reality and instead worshipped what they saw instead of the one who made it all. He puts the Jewish people on trial too and, and, and he, he points out the revelation that they've been given as the, Jew, as the chosen people and yet their history is one of, of sin and rebellion and they're guilty of sin as well. He says that all are guilty. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Then as we go on, he explains the gospel. That it is not by works of the law that we're justified, but it is by the grace of God and sending His Son. And if we by faith trust in Him and in His finished work, we are saved. We are justified in God's eyes. And then in Romans 8, he talks about the security of the believer in in the Lord's hands. And so you would think, boy, where do you go from there? You just talked about how nothing can separate us from God's love. Let's, let's give a salutation and close that letter, Paul. But that's not what he does. Because after this, this great this swell of, of praise to the Lord for how we, are, we can never be separated from Him, I want you to look at Romans chapter 9, verse 1. Because here, Paul begins talking about Israel. Because what's going to happen here is, is it's in, if you can almost read the white space in between Romans 8 and the beginning of Romans 9, there's a question there. There's a question that the reader might ask, and that is, really, Paul? Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ? Nothing? I understand the height, the depth, the, the, the powers and principalities, things present, things to come. I get that. But what if, as a people... You rejected the Messiah. You rejected the revelation of God. Wouldn't that separate you from the love of God? Wouldn't that mean you are done? There's no, there's no hope for you if you reject that? And so Paul in Romans 9, this is what we read. He writes, I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness on the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. Stop right there. This is the Apostle Paul writing this. This is the same man who just, just rejoiced in the fact that nothing can separate us, and yet he kind of comes off of this high dramatically, and he says, in spite of all of that wonderful truth, my heart is grieved. Why is Paul's heart grieved? Look at verse 3. In verse 3, he writes, For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. I don't know about you, I am not to a point where I can say honestly that I would willingly be accursed from Christ. I I would not be saved. I would go to hell for eternity if it meant the salvation of other people. But such is Paul's love for his own people. He says, if, it's not possible, of course, for another to be a curse from Christ for the sake of, of another person or another people. But Paul is saying, if it was possible, I would be willing to do that for the sake of my brothers, for the sake of the Jewish people. Because what Paul is going to do now is he's going to describe who these people are. He says in verses 1-3 through three that these are my people. Israel, they're my people. They're the people that I grieve for. And in verse, verses 4 and 5, he describes Israel as a privileged people. A privileged people. Look at this. Look at these privileges he discusses, discusses here. He describes them, he says, verse 4, Who are Israelites? To whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Paul describes the the privileges of this people. He first references their adoption. Uh, We referenced this uh, yesterday in in some of the, the messages, but when you think about the nation of Israel, They were adopted by God. They were not a people. God formed them out of one man named, what was his name? From Ur of the Chaldees? 
Abraham. He, he takes this one man, Joshua says, this man is an idol worshiper, but he takes him and he makes promises to him and he says, I'm going to make of you a great nation. A people is going to come from you. Well, that's a promise. That's, that's an adoption as a people. Paul goes on to say that they also were given the glory. What's the glory? Well, it's the Shekinah, the very presence of God. If you remember when the, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, are coming out of Egypt, who guided them? Well, it was, it was Moses. He was, he was the human leader. Who is Moses following? Pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. When they would set up the tabernacle, when, when, the, when the, the glory of God would stop moving, that cloud or that pillar would stop moving, what were they to do? Set up camp. And at the center of their camp, what would be there? The tabernacle. And all the tribes were to, to make their, uh, their, build their tents around that, thousands of tents around this, this, this central tent called the tabernacle. And the tabernacle would have been just a, just a tent if it weren't for, what, for the presence that was inside the Holy of Holies. What was in there? The very presence of God. That is the glory of God. No other people was able to, to witness this. You know, in the, in the temple, you remember that King David, in 2 Samuel 7, he wants to build a temple for the Lord. And, and it's from a heart of great love for God. David is a man after God's own heart. And, and he, he looks around and he says, look at me, I'm living in this beautiful palace. And he looks out the window and he sees the tabernacle. And he says, why is it that I, this, this mere man, should be living in this opulent palace while God himself is out, is out in this tabernacle? And remember, the tabernacle was portable because the Jewish people were going to be moving all the time. But now God has planted us back in our land. He's given us our land. He's planted us here. Surely there should be a permanent dwelling place for God, a house for God. And he goes to Nathan the prophet, and Nathan the prophet, he, he tells him what his plans are. And Nathan says, go, do it. That's a good idea. And in the evening, in the night, Nathan receives a, a warning from God and says, no, that's not what you're supposed to do. So David is told, no, appreciate it, David, but you're a man of bloodshed. You're not going to build me a house. It'll be your son who will build me a house. What's his son's name? Will his, will, who will the son be who will build that? Solomon. But, but God does this uh, often in Scripture. He does it to Daniel as well. He, he flips that prayer. He flips that desire. And he says, David, I know you want to build me a house. Guess what? I am going to build you a house. And he, he promises a kingdom to him. But it was for the zeal of God's glory that would dwell in that temple that, that David wanted to build that. Solomon does. And if you remember at the dedication ceremony for that temple that David doesn't get to build, but Solomon does, what is the zenith of that, of that dedication ceremony? <sighs> when the presence of God enters the Holy of Holies. Could just anybody go into the Holy of Holies whenever they wanted to? No. There was only one man every year. He was the high priest. He had to be of the tribe of Levi. And the high priest would be able to go in there, but not whenever he wanted. He could go in once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And this was a day of trembling for him because he's going to go in to the very presence of God and he would go in there and first he had to make a sacrifice for himself so that his sins would be atoned for. And then he could go in and he would make a sacrifice for the atonement of the sins of Israel for that year. So, so, so uh, fearful were the people about the presence of God, that glory of God, that they, were to, they put bells on the bottoms of the high priest's garments. God tells them to do that. So they, you would know when he was going in and when he was coming out. But what we're also told is that they would sometimes they would tie a rope to his ankle because if he went in there in an unworthy manner, Let's say he didn't, he didn't offer a sacrifice for himself first or, or whatever the situation might be. The people knew, you don't go in there to get that man. you got to pull him out. 
So the nation of Israel, they were the people who got to witness the glory of God. I couldn't go in there. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a goy. I'm a Gentile. I couldn't just barge in there. So the glory of God was a protected thing given only to the nation of Israel. We also have the covenants. or multiple covenants made with the Jewish people. And we looked at some of those this, this past weekend. There is the Abrahamic covenant in which God promises to Abraham that he's going to give him land. That's the land of Israel, the one that uh, there's a lot of fighting about today. Uh, give you, a, give you a, a, an inside scoop. God's already settled who it belongs to. Right? It belongs to the Jewish people. But he promised that land to them. He promised seed to Abraham that they would be a great nation. It would be through him that, that the ultimate seed of Abraham would come, who is the Messiah, the one promised back in Genesis to Adam and Eve. And he promised him blessing. Not only that Abraham would receive blessing, but that he would be a blessing. And as we looked at yesterday, we, we learned that it is through Abraham that all families of the earth would be blessed. And ultimately, that would be through the Messiah and the salvation that he made available. And this morning, in, in our morning service, we're going to look at, at what that cost the Messiah, what that cost Jesus to make the families of the earth and the nation of Israel be able to receive that blessing. There is the Mosaic Covenant in which God gives the law, the Torah, to the Jewish people. And it was, a, it was not something that if the Jewish people kept it, they would somehow be saved. That wasn't, it was never uh, that purpose in the law, but it did keep them distinct from the rest of the nations. Uh, for example, there's a law in the Torah that the Jewish people were not to boil a kid, a baby goat, in its mother's milk. And there's debate about, well, why is that? God doesn't explain every law why he does that, but there's many who believe that that was part of a religious cult practice of the nations surrounding Israel. And, and so with these kinds of laws, God didn't just give them willy-nilly. He had a purpose in why he gave them, and this law was to keep Israel separate. We often see that, by the way, in, in, in the New Testament, that we are to be a separated people, a holy people. Not for the sake of being separate, not for the sake of being you know, the weirdos in town, but for the sake of being separate unto the Lord, right? That we can serve Him, that we can be a witness to other people. And that was very much the case with Israel. In, in being given the law, they were to be kept separate and holy so that the nations around them would see there is something different not only about this people, but about the God who they serve. And so that they could then tell them, about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It was really a reversed missions. You know, the church today, we are given the great commission. The Lord gave us that just before he ascended. And, and what are we to do? We are to go into all the world and preach the gospel. What do we do when we, when we have someone who the Lord calls to go to a specific people or a specific region to share the good news? The church sends them out, Right? With the exception of Jonah, we really don't see that in the, New, in the Old Testament. You know what we see? We see that this little piece of land was situated in just such a place that the land of Israel, would have to, you'd have to go through it if you wanted to do any trade. If you wanted to go from Africa into Asia or Europe or vice versa. And when the people, when, when these, the nations would come through here, they would see that this is a unique people and this is a unique God. And they would glorify God. And you see throughout the Bible, throughout the narrative of, of biblical history, Gentiles who come to faith in the God of Israel. Think of Ruth. Think of Rahab. Uh, this, this, this existed all throughout Israel's history. And that was because of the Mosaic Covenant. You also have what's called the Land Covenant. This is found in Deuteronomy 29 and 30. Where God promises, yes, that the, the land belongs to the nation of Israel, to the Jewish people. But in order to live in that land and to be blessed in that land, they would need to abide by the, by the Mosaic Covenant. And if they failed to do that, the Mosaic Covenant said they would be scattered. We're experiencing, the Jewish people are even experiencing that today in the diaspora, the scattering. But in the Land Covenant, God promises that He will one day, when the nation of Israel repents, what, what, what will He do? Bring them back to their land. And they'll be planted there, never to be removed or harassed again. We have the Davidic covenant, and I alluded to that in, in 2 Samuel 7, 
where God promises to David, yes, you wanted to build me a house, I'm going to build you a house, David. I'm going to build you a dynasty. And that's where we get the term, the house of David. That through David, there was going to be a perpetual line of, of royalty. And even if there isn't a king sitting on the throne, which there hasn't been since uh, the, the uh, Babylonian captivity, that there will still always be someone in line for that throne. Which is very important because when you open the book of Matthew, what do you find in chapter 1? A genealogy. And I know it's the thing we like to skip sometimes when we get to Matthew. And they, oh, here we go, the family history. I can't even keep track of my own. But this was important for the Jewish readers because what did they need to know? Jesus claims to be the Messiah. His followers are claiming He's the Messiah. Question, He has to be the descendant of two people. He has to be the descendant of Abraham and He has to be the descendant of King David. And so the opening of Matthew tells us that He is the son of David, the son of Abraham. He is who He said He was. And it's going to be through that line and if you, you can trace that lineage, it comes right down to Jesus. He is the rightful heir to the throne. Now it just so happens that because Jesus is God, when He sits on the throne of David, when He establishes His kingdom on earth, guess what? Forever. He is the eternal seed of David. And then in Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, we have the new covenant. And this is the covenant where God says it's not like the Mosaic covenant. It's going to be a covenant not written on stone, but written on flesh on your heart and that the jewish people the house of israel and the house of judah will once again be made one and god will not have to have prophets and teachers coming to them and rebuking them and telling them hey follow the law follow god's word he said you will all know it from the least of you to the greatest of you why because it'll be graven on your heart and that's yet future so these covenants are given to the jewish people paul also says here that they were given the law, and we touched on this with the Mosaic Covenant, that this law is a good thing. It tells them about God. It keeps them separate. What else does it do? It shows them their sinfulness. The law is a blessing. Because what the law does is like a, like a sign at an amusement park when you're a kid, and you'd, you'd go up there and you'd think, oh yeah, I can ride the Millennium Force down at Cedar Point. And then you get up to that, that, that marker to see, so it says you must be this high to ride this ride. What do you find out sometimes? I fall short. And that's exactly what another purpose of the law was for, is to show us, and to show the nation of Israel in particular, how far short they fall from God's glory, and that they need the Messiah He promised to them. You also have the temple service. Serving God in the temple was a privilege. It was given to the tribe of Levi uh, of the nation of Israel where they would come and they would serve the Lord. It says they were given promises. What promises? Thousands of promises throughout the Old Testament that weren't covenantal, but they were still promises that God says, this is what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you someday a kingdom. I'm, I'm going to return. I'm going to do these things. But then he ends... Romans 9, verse 5, with saying that according to the flesh, who came? Christ, Messiah, the Anointed One, who is overall the eternally blessed God. And so all of these privileges were given to Israel. They are a privileged people. But I want you to turn to Romans chapter 10. By the way, I hope you will take time to read carefully through all of these chapters. We're, we're just kind of touching on them. But please read them for yourself to get a, a firm grasp on what God is saying here through Paul. So Paul has said that Israel, they are his people. They are a privileged people in Romans 9. And yet in Romans 10, what we find is that Paul writes that Israel is a lost people. They're a lost people. Notice how he opens verse 1 of chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be, what's your Bible say? Saved. He has a desire for the Jewish people to be saved. And you know, sometimes we'll hear this, not, not frequently, but sometimes Christians will ask, well, do Jewish people need to be saved because they're the chosen people? Uh, aren't they saved already? No. No. God has, has 
purposely chosen the nation of Israel for His purposes, but that does not mean that in being the chosen nation, each person is automatically saved. Jewish people need to come to faith the same way that you and I do. We see that all throughout, uh, throughout the New Testament. Um, Romans 9 speaks of this as well. The problem here is that not all Israel is in right standing with God. They're not. You have to come to faith in the Messiah. Keep your finger in Romans 10 and turn back to the Gospel of John chapter 8. I just want to show you what the Lord Jesus says about the Jewish people, His own people. John chapter 8, beginning in verse 33 Jesus here is going back and forth with the Pharisees. We often see them in the New Testament. He has just in John 8.32, He says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Verse 33, They answered Him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Well, first of all, that's a lie, isn't it? The Jewish people have been uh, in bondage. They were for 400 years. They're not a free people. But Jesus answers them in verse 34. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Now notice verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. He goes on to say that these Pharisees, yes, they might be descendants of Abraham, but spiritually, who is their father? Same father we all would all have apart from Christ, and that is Satan. And so he condemns these Pharisees, and he says, "Look, just because you're of Abraham's lineage doesn't mean that you are in right standing with God." And so back to Romans 10, we see this same heartbeat that Paul has for his people. He says, "My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved." Going on to verse two, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. You know, we're we're talking about the the nation of Israel here, the Jewish people, but this is really a problem with all of us apart from Christ. Uh, We have a world full of false religions and false philosophies and false uh, ways of thinking about heaven and hell and eternity and all of these things. And, And we can believe these things with great zeal. But zeal does not replace truth, does it? And that's the case with much of the Jewish people. There's a zeal for the religion. There's a zeal for God Himself. But notice that He says it is a zeal that is not according to knowledge. Let me ask you this. I'm assuming that you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you became a believer, we'll say when you got saved... Was it because one morning you woke up and you said, I bet I am alienated from God because of my sin. And because of my sin, I am destined for hell, but I bet God, because He is is a loving God and He is merciful, He sent His Son to die on my place because He is just. The Messiah died because He is merciful. He pardoned me. Is that how it worked? I don't think so. You look like smart people, but you're not that smart, right? I'm not that smart. It came about how, ultimately, somehow, in your story of salvation, I guarantee what happened is it involved this book. It involved the Word of God. Either you reading it, or you hearing it preached, or someone sharing it with you, it involved the Word of God. It involved, it involved truth. It involved the knowledge of God's Word, didn't it? Well, Paul says that's, the, that's one of the missing components. There's a zeal, but not according to knowledge. Not according to the truth of God's Word. And so he builds on this in verse 3. He says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness... Why are they ignorant of God's righteousness? Because they don't study what God says here. How God has revealed His standard of righteousness. 
For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Ladies and gentlemen, this is all of us apart from Christ. I don't know your religious background. Maybe you had no formal religious background. Maybe you were in a very religious background. Whatever it was, you had some idea of the, the, righteous, the standard of righteousness. And you know what the standard of righteousness is for us apart from Christ? The person looking at us in the mirror. We are our own standard for righteousness. We look at ourselves and, and we say, well, I'm not perfect, but I'm not this guy. Right? I'm, I become the standard of righteousness. And God says that's true of the Jewish people because they, they haven't submitted to the righteousness of God. They seek to establish their own. And often in the Jewish community, the standard for righteousness is being basically a good person, keeping as much of the law, as much of the commandments as you can, making sure your, your mitzvot, your good deeds, outweigh your bad deeds. Paul says that's not going to cut it. That's not the righteousness of God. Because what is the righteousness of God? Better question, who is the righteousness of God? Jesus the Messiah. Look at verse 4. He says it for us. He says, For Messiah, for Christ, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. At the cross, it is an equal footing. doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Gentile. You need to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. So that is where Paul writes about this people being a lost people needing the Messiah and His salvation. But I want you to turn the page to Romans 11. Romans 11. Because in Romans chapter 11, Paul deals with Israel's future. If we closed with Romans 10, we might think, well, yep, they need, they need the Lord, but who knows? Who knows if they have a future? Who knows if people, Jewish people will come to know Him? Well, in Romans 11, 1, look at what Paul says. He says, I say then, has God cast away His people? There are believers who would answer that in the affirmative. That God doesn't have any future for this people. They're done in His plan. Look at how Paul answers it. Certainly not. In some translations you may be reading, it says, God forbid. It says, absolutely not. And, and, and you say, well, Paul, how do you know that God's not done? Look at what he says. He says, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. He says, exhibit A. When I look in the mirror every morning, Paul would say, I am reminded of the fact that God is not done with the Jewish people because look at what he has done with me. He saved me. He called me to ministry. He's calling me to pen this letter talking about Israel's future. No, God is not done. In fact, he says that in verse 2. God has not cast away His people whom He foreknew. Or do you not know what the Scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left and they seek my life. Do you remember this account in the Old Testament? Elijah is a prophet and a prophet. Nobody wanted to be a prophet in the Old Testament. You, you see prophets often trying to get out of it. No, 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 not me, Lord. And Elijah is called to be a prophet. And, and one of the reasons people didn't want to be a prophet is because they weren't just going out to the nations heralding the good news. Their job was to take to task their own people. And they were to come to their own people and say, you're guilty and God is going to bring judgment on you. And as Elijah looks around at his nation, he sees absolute apostasy. And he thinks, I am the only believer in Israel left. Do you ever feel like that in, in, in your own society? Like, boy, we're the faithful few. There's, there's hardly anybody around that's a believer. But notice in verse 4, Paul writes, But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. God's answer to Elijah is, Elijah, get up. You're not the only one. I've got 7,000 other people just like you in this country, in this nation. This remnant. Yes, the nation, the, 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 the nation as a whole is an apostate nation, but I have a remnant within that nation that loves me and that is seeking to do what I have said. And Paul says in verse 5, even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant 
according to the election of grace. He says even now, when he is writing, and we can say, I can say even by experience, even now in 2024, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There are members of the Jewish community who know Jesus personally. And they don't view it as being uh, an alien thing to being Jewish. They see it as a complete fulfillment of being Jewish, that they know the Messiah that was promised to their people. There are Jewish people coming to know Him. So Paul makes it very clear that God has not cast away His people. I want you to look at... uh, the end of Romans 11. Paul will go on throughout Romans 11 to talk about the fact that, yes, there are, there's this tree of blessing, this Abrahamic covenant, and there are individual branches, Jewish people, who have been cut off from that because of their unbelief. And there have been these, this wild olive tree that's been grafted in of Gentiles who believe in the, in the promise of Messiah that they would be blessed by the Messiah in Him. But that it's not, that it's not as if God is now done with that nation. Because look at verse 25. We looked at this yesterday, but it says, For I do not desire, brethren, he's writing to the mostly Gentile church at Rome, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. He says, guys, Roman church, don't get puffed up. Don't be boastful. Don't think that because you have somehow, you've been grafted in by faith that you should boast against the natural branches against the nation of Israel. He says that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So he says there is a blindness. That word is also sometimes translated a hardening. A hardening of the heart, a blinding of the eyes as it concerns the Gospel for many Jewish people. But notice he says it's in part. It's not every Jewish person. There are Jewish people coming to faith in Him. And it's not forever. This blindness is going, only going to last until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Until God is done dealing primarily with Gentiles. I believe that refers to the rapture of the church when the church is taken up. And then what does God do? He turns back to the nation of Israel. Jeremiah speaks to this as a time of Jacob's trouble. It's a, it's a time, Zechariah says, of refining like, like gold and silver are refined through fire. It's going to be a painful time in the last days in which the Jewish people are put through the ringer and they are tested. But the, that the nation that comes out, one-third of the total, that remnant that comes through, what's going to happen to them? Well, Paul says in verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, yes, they're enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Why? For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God's not going to back out on his promises. He's saying that there are, there are people coming to faith. I was telling someone yesterday, sometimes I'll go to a church, to a, to a conference, a missions conference, and I'll hear somebody who's ministering to the Muslim people, uh, particularly down in the Dearborn area, not far from where I live. And they will say, we're seeing people come to faith all the time. It, it's amazing what God's doing in the Arab community. And I have to sit there and I, I think, boy, it's a trickle over here in the Jewish community. But you know what? We're promised. And we're not in competition, by the way. We want all people to be saved. But then I come back to Romans 11 and I remember he says that there's coming a day when all Israel will be saved. That remnant of the nation that comes through that time of Jacob's trouble, they will be saved to a person. Is there a future for the nation of Israel? You better believe there is. But let's close with this. What about the church? You see, the church is distinct from Israel. Israel is an ethnic nation. They're descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're begun back in Genesis chapter 12. The church, we're founded at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. We're not an ethnic people. We're a multi-ethnic people. right? We have people who are black and white and red and yellow and people who are from all over the world, but all of them have one thing in common. What is that? They have been saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus. That's the difference between the church and Israel, one of the significant uh, differences. And throughout his epistles, Paul makes a clear distinction between the church and Israel. 
But Paul also writes that we are benefiting from Israel's fall. When Israel rejected their Messiah, that salvation which Jesus says is of the Jews. Remember, he talks to the woman at the well and she's a Samaritan and she says, you know, we've heard that, that uh, we're supposed to worship at the, this mountain and, and the Jewish people say we're supposed to worship at that mountain. She's kind of trying to change the subject because he's been dealing with her personal sin. And he says, woman, there's coming a day when you won't worship at this mountain or that mountain. You'll worship in, in, in spirit and in truth. But he tells her that salvation is of the who? The Jewish people. And so that salvation has been, has been expanded to include us as well. And I want you to see this in Romans chapter 11, but I want you to go back to verse 11. We're going a little out of order here, but I want you to see how Paul talks about the Gentiles. In verse 11, he says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Have the Jewish people stumbled and they've fallen from grace? God has no future for them? God forbid, certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So we are benefiting from Israel's fall. Because of their rejection, the gospel, all part of God's plan, goes out to the nations. As a, as a Gentile, I am so grateful that the gospel didn't stay in Jerusalem. And it got to me back in 1996 in the Iwana program at a little church in the Thumb of Michigan. And you can put yourself in there. You can think of your own story. Aren't you glad that the gospel wasn't kept to the Jewish people? It went out to the nations. But you notice there, there's a responsibility for the church. That the church is not to lord it over the Jewish people and say, look, we have the, we have the gospel, we have the Messiah, you can't have it. Romans 11.11 11 says we are to provoke them to jealousy. Now, I understand in my, my brief research that Manistee doesn't have a huge Jewish population. I don't think the UP has a huge Jewish population. So let me ask you this. Is your life making other people jealous? I don't mean about the car you drive and the house you, you live in and the clothes you wear. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying, is your spiritual life, is your walk with Christ enviable? Do people look at you and say, you know, it's not that they're perfect, but I see them going through trials. I see how they handle difficulties in life. I see how they are, they're, they're, they're full of joy even in sad circumstances. There's something different about them, and I want that. Only you can answer that. It's between you and the Lord. I know I have to examine myself quite often. And you know what the antidote to it is? If, if you say, and I'll honestly no, it's probably not. That's honest and that's good. The answer is not to just try harder and I'm going to, I have to really live a perfect life. That's not what it is. What it is is coming back to your first love and saying, where did I part from this? Am I walking in the Spirit? Am I seeking to bring myself under the authority of God's Word? Am I allowing the Spirit of God to have free course in my life and and manifest the fruit of the Spirit in my life, then that what's what, that's what will make people jealous. Am I enjoying the joy of the Lord? Or am I grieving the Holy Spirit the way I'm living? It's a daily check, probably a minute-by-minute a minute check that we need to be, be looking at ourselves, asking ourselves that question. But I'll tell you, the Christian who lives a life that is in accordance with God's Word and seeks to please Him, a person who's walking in the Spirit, they're going to make people jealous, both Jewish people and Gentiles. And that jealousy is an opportunity for us to then say, let me tell you about how imperfect I am, but how perfect my Savior is who's made all the difference in my life.